Good afternoon. I'm Peter Bergen. Welcome to the New America Foundation. We're on the National Security Studies Program here. It's uh, very much a pleasure to welcome Eamon Guerin to speak to us today about jihad and politics in North Africa. Eamon is uh, very well positioned to have that discussion. Uh, he's uh, been teaching a course on North, North Africa at SAIS. Uh, he is a author of the book Sahara, which is available for purchase outside. I'm sure he'll sign it if you press him. Uh, he only after they bought it. <laughs> only after they bought it. My dad used to say it's a dollar off if I sign it. Um, <laughs> but um, Eamon is also an Arabist. He spent considerable time uh, living under the, in, with the Bedou in Western Egypt. Um, he went on to pursue solo camel-powered explorations in the Egyptian Sahara. Um, he is uh, somebody who's written for a wide variety of newspapers, the Daily, Tele Daily Telegraph, The Independent, uh, Al Haram, and others. And uh, he s said that he would be speaking for about um, half an hour, and then we'll have a Q&A and then open it up to you. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning, or no, this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, 20 to 30 minutes uh, seems hardly fair to try and do justice to the problems of North Africa, security issues, economic problems, political shenanigans, and the rest. But I think that very often the most interesting part of these meetings is the Q&A. I'm not going to shortchange you on the time. I will talk and introduce some very uh, salient points. I hope you'll agree. Um, and while this is going to be a conversation, I'd like to start with a couple of illustrations. I know it's not a slide presentation, but I think just for the understanding of the area that we're dealing with, I'm just going to hold up these two pictures here. I, I've used this in class before, and those who've seen it will recognize the outline of Mali, superimposed on the United States of America, minus Hawaii and Alaska. Just get that into your heads when you want to think about the scale of the land mass we're talking about. And once you've got that image in your head, I'll show you the second slide. That's the US over a map of Africa. You can see it almost disappears in the Sahara. So when we jump up and down and criticize Force X or Army Y for not having done a more effective job in the region, do bear in mind, please, the sheer scale of what they are trying to deal with. With those images burned into your retinas, let's carry on. Um, anybody who has been at one of my lectures in the past, whether it's at SAIS, where I'm pleased to teach, or any of the venues on both sides of the Atlantic, we will know that I always like to start with a bit of establishing history. Now, this is as true for a, a talk about Timbuktu, as Mali, as North Africa, as global affairs. So forgive me if I go back to ancient Egypt. Don't worry, it's, it's, worth, it's worth listening to. The ancient Egyptians, as you know, uh, thrived on the Nile. There's an east bank and a west bank of the Nile. They lived on the east. The dead were buried on the west bank. Everything in the west of the Nile was the land of the dead. This is the place where souls were laid to rest or otherwise. But more interestingly for the Egyptian model is that the Sahara, the land of the dead, all of the land to the west of the Nile was the area of insecurity and instability. It was a land that they could not govern, which is why in Egyptian religion and Egyptian mythology, the desert lands were left alone. They were left to the people who inhabited them and the control over them was always tenuous. Let's move forward a few hundred years. Ancient Rome. Ancient Rome, as you know, did a fairly credible job of smashing certain local populations in North Africa. Carthage must be destroyed. How many of us remember that from Latin classes? But what did they do after they got Carthage? After Ifriqiya, modern Tunisia, was conquered? How far south did they go into the desert? 
Well, for those of you from the British Isles who have been traveling in, in northern England and Scotland, you may well have come across this thing called Hadrian's Wall. It's a big wall. It wasn't so much to um, limit movement between the Scots and the English, um, as might be the case today, but it was to stop the Scots coming in and attacking the Romans. They had similar walls, limes, soft walls of sand, berms, we would call them today, built in southern Tunisia. It was to prevent raids from the marauding desert tribes coming north. They couldn't control the desert. This is Rome we're talking about still. The Roman Empire, the mighty Roman Empire, before whom everyone quailed, but not the inhabitants of the Sahara. These walls were kept there in southern Tunisia for hundreds of years because they recognized they couldn't control and they couldn't tax the populations of the Sahara. I'm leaping right ahead now to the 15th century. There's a gentleman whose name you should all know when you leave here today. Remember the name of Mansa Musa, Emperor of Emperors. In the 15th century, he was in charge of the Malian Empire, an extensive empire which is not exactly contiguous with the nation state of Mali today. It was much bigger. He was the wealthiest man in the world, not just for his period, but for all time. If anybody questions the validity of this statement, go away and read Forbes magazine, December 2012 edition. They have Mansa Musa listed as the wealthiest man who ever lived. When Mansa Musa left the heart of the Sahara, his kingdom in Timbuktu, to go on the Hajj pilgrimage to the kingdom now of Saudi Arabia, he passed through Cairo. He had 80 camels on his journey just to carry his gold. He spent so much in Cairo on his way to Mecca that when he came back, he had to borrow money to make the journey home again to the Sahara. If anybody has ever traveled to Egypt and feels that they've been fleeced for a few dollars too many, it says nothing compared to what Mansa Musa went through. The gold price in the whole of the Middle East was devalued for at least a decade because of what Mansa Musa spent. That's the 15th century. In the 21st century, gold remains central to the Malian economy. It's not one of the world's largest suppliers of gold, but there is so little else in that country that they do rely on it more heavily than they should, and certainly more heavily than they would like to. So today, we have French troops in Mali. We have Malian troops excluded from the north of their own country. We have Chadian troops leaving Mali. Everybody wants to focus on the jihadis. Everybody wants to know about Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. They are a security threat. They are not an existential threat. I'm going to talk later about solutions as I see them for the problems both in Mali and the wider Sahel. This term, the arc of instability, is used frequently now to describe the whole of the Sahel. It's been unstable for a long time, and it's not just because of very few small radical Islamist groups. The problems are much deeper than that. If it were only a problem of two or three terrorist groups, it would be much easier to solve the problem in the short term. So to Mali, the problems, they're threefold primarily, but each one of these umbrella terms covers a basket of ills. We have political problems, economic problems, and beyond those, social problems. The three are obviously interconnected. Have that Venn diagram with the three umbrella terms in your head, and there are any number of points of overlap. But let's start with the political problems, because I think these are at the heart of what's happening in Mali today. Some people have called Mali a model democracy in Africa since 1991, 1992. Other people, whose voices perhaps were not heard 
as clearly as they might have been, recognized for a very long time that Mali was a political lightweight. Election turnouts across the Sahel are never, have never been tremendously high. In Mali, in every election since 1992, and indeed including 1992, the turnout has been in the high 30s. That is to say, less than 40% of the eligible electorate turn out for elections in Mali. Does that suggest a community, a population that is actively engaged in choosing a new president? Not a bit of it. Why don't they turn out for elections? Well, we've asked the Malians, and the Malians have spoken. The main reason they offer is because the political elites in Bamako, a long way from the north of the country, are corrupt, self-serving, and self-interested. I think this is a problem which has been there much longer than the past 20 years. But it's a problem which we have yet to address when trying to push forward a better Mali in the future. The social problems I mentioned, this imaginary line that divides the north and the south of the country, between those who, like the Tuareg, the Arab populations in the north who self-identify as white versus those who identify as black, the African versus Arab question in Mali. It's significant, and it has very ancient roots. What we are not seeing in Mali, however, is a clash of civilizations a la Huntingdon. 90% of the population in Mali are Muslim. 5% are Christian. And as some wags observe, 100% are animist. The religious nuances in Mali must not be understated. It is vital that we understand both the softer, if I may use such a term, Sufi traditions which have existed in Mali for centuries, indeed since the time of Mansa Musa and the foundation of the great uh, universities in the Sahara. But the influx of jihadi, Salafi radicals has not happened overnight. It has not happened since the fall of Gaddafi in Libya. It has been taking place for more than a decade, closer to 15 years. There has been an influx of money and an influx of teachers from certain countries who have a long tradition of radical Salafist thinking. The point I'm making is that it's very complex. And I think across the board, Mali's problems and the problems of security across the Sahel are very, very complex. And we have to understand this complexity if we are serious about finding solutions to the problems in Mali and indeed across the Sahel. With solutions in mind, let me throw out a few ideas, some of them radical, some of them less so. The first thing I would say is that any solutions to the complex problems of Mali must be driven by Malians. We've all heard this term, local solutions to local problems. It's the only thing that will work, which isn't to say that we take a step back and let Mali stumble over themselves to try and work out what's best. No. We should be there to partner with those who would like us to partner with them. There's no point trying to have a partnership with somebody who's not willing. And the idea of willing partners is essential. Now, a major problem I think we have in Mali today is the lack of political will to implement credible changes to the system. A very important plank of any solution to the problems in Mali, whether it's the security problems, the political problems, or the social problems, is a national dialogue. In South Africa, very different scenario, of course, but the Truth and Reconciliation Committee produced great results. In Northern Ireland, the British government sat down with people that once upon a time they said they would never sit down with. The situation in Northern Ireland today, while not completely rosy, is certainly a damn sight better 
than it was when I was growing up, during the time of the so-called Troubles. And that's because there was this conversation taking place, but it has to include all parties. Now, some parties may not want to participate. Some parties we know for sure will not participate. This is where we come to the likes of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. They don't want to negotiate. They're not interested in political power in Mali, not as you or I would understand it. Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, as Al-Qaeda elsewhere, offers nihilism rather than solution. This is not going to produce a healthy outcome in Mali. However, a big issue in Mali is the government seems unlikely to engage in a genuine national dialogue that offers a chance of a reconciliation committee. In fact, their heads are still in the sand about the Tuareg problem, as they call it. And before we, we dwell too much on the Tuareg, these mythical blue-veiled people of the desert, let's remember that the Tuareg population in Mali makes up less than 10% of the national population. Of those 10%, you'd be lucky to find 1% of the Tuareg population who belong to a group such as the MNLA, that group which wants autonomy, or indeed independence in some quarters, for the Tuareg in northern Mali. They are simply not representative of all Tuareg. This is important because when we, the West, the French, the Americans, and the British, travel to Mali to start talking to people, our instinct is to go for those who are most familiar, at least whose name is most familiar. And the Tuareg win out every time in that debate. We know about the Tuareg, we believe. We've heard their name. We see them as interlocutors with whom we can deal. But please let's remember that they are not representative of the whole of the country. To be credible, a dialogue must be inclusive. Elections. Elections are set to take place in Mali at the end of July. I think they should be postponed, and I'm not alone in that. I do not believe that they will be postponed. The French are pushing for them. The Americans are pushing for the elections. The British, the Europeans, ECOWAS indeed, are pushing for the elections. The elections will probably take place, as I said. But make no mistake about it, they will not be credible and they will not be meaningful. If you want an election, fine, have your election. But don't, please, five years hence, turn around and say, well, Mali, model democracy, we had elections, how's everything fallen apart? Why won't the elections work now? Several reasons. For one thing, we have one million internally displaced persons and refugees as a result of the crisis in Mali. The population of Mali is 14 million. If one million are dispersed around the country and indeed fled to other countries, they are not registered for any election. Even before the current two-year-old crisis in Mali, there was not an electoral register in that country worthy of the name. Last month, this is April 2013, the contract was awarded to start drawing up the electoral roll for Mali, April, for a July election. In a country where infrastructure is absent, in a great majority of the north of the country, this troublesome area that the government in Bamako should be so keen to draw in to any political participation. For those who have traveled along the roads in Mali, you will know what a deeply uncomfortable journey is to be had there. July, it's the rainy season. What roads exist are impassable at that time of year. So we have an electoral roll about to be drawn up between April and July in a country where at the best of times communication is poor, trying to do that at the worst possible time of the year when everybody who's engaged in agriculture is busy with that, when the roads are washed out, when communications are wholly absent. 
These are just some of the reasons why the elections are flawed. But let's press on. Why? Because it's too costly to keep French troops in the country. So we must have an election. Then we will have a legitimate government in Bamako. And then America will be allowed to speak again to the authorities in that country. At the moment, of course, because of uh, American law, we're not allowed to have direct talks with the government. These coup leaders who have restored a civilian government after much humming and hawing. The political situation across the country is a shambles. There was a doctoral thesis written some years ago by a German scholar. It talks about farming and life in Mali. The English title is the hardest job in the world. Says it all, really. It's a tough old place in which to live. And when agriculture is disturbed, when there is a coup in the south, when you're dealing with radical Islamist groups coming through burning your village, what are you going to do for money? What are you going to do to support your family when the crops fail as they are failing across the Sahel? I know what I'd do. If I had to support my family in such circumstances, I would go with the first person who offered me money, cash money. Now, who do you think that is? Is it a government coming in with development projects? No. Is it aid from the international community? No. That's far from ideal anyway. It's criminals. We talk about Al-Qaeda. It's a great word. It means we can get excited about counterterrorism moves in the desert. And there is room for counterterrorism, and I will deal with it in a minute. But before we think about terrorist groups, think about criminals. The United Nations estimates that 18 tons of cocaine travels through Mali north towards Europe every year. 18 tons a year. Some estimates put it at 50 tons a year. Now, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Mujwa, Ansardin, MNLA, all of these groups who proclaim, whether it's religious jihad or political movements or autonomy for Azawad, they are all engaged in criminal activity, making money from the drugs trade, from the trade in arms, from the general instability. And I signal these groups as criminal gangs as much as they are politically motivated. But also, the rumors are very strong that the previous government in Bamako too was involved in this criminal activity. This is not an original idea of mine I'm putting out there. The literature is extensive to suggest corruption at the very highest level. We know it certainly exists at the very lowest levels. So then we come to this wider so-called Arab Spring and people saying that the fallout from Libya was responsible for the collapse of Mali. Well, it wasn't. How's that for a decisive response? Mm -hmm. I would say this. Anybody, again, who's traveled in West Africa will know that there is um, no trouble getting hold of weapons. If you think for a minute that we had to wait for the storehouses in Libya to be opened up before people in Mali could obtain weapons, then you're very much mistaken. What we do have now is more weapons than before. That is true. But Gaddafi's downfall was an accelerant, not the catalyst for the problems in Mali. It's true that we must look at the entire Sahelian region and right across the Sahara as interrelated problems. But it would be wrong if we focused just on Al-Qaeda, just on Libya, just on this or just on that. I said at the beginning it was complex. If you're not prepared to accept the complexity, then don't start offering solutions because they won't work. It might make you feel better, but it's not us that has to feel better. It's the countries on, uh, in the region and it's the people on the ground. And that's why, ideally, we must have local solutions. I think I'll just say a final word about Al-Qaeda and the terrorist slash criminal groups operating in Mali and indeed the wider region. 
And that word would be ransoms. In the case of instability in the region, it doesn't take much to form a group. Anybody who follows the ins and outs of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb or the others will see splits and counter splits. Just last month, there are another two splits in Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. These new groups, little more than cells sometimes of 10 people or more, are growing in number, certainly. And the smaller they are, the more difficult they are, perhaps, to track down. However, where in certain parts of the world we've shown a willingness to use drones to start blowing people up, I would be very careful before we go down that path in the Sahara. Now, I know that the government in Niger have allowed drones to operate out of their country. These are surveillance drones. And I think that drones are a very useful tool for surveillance, for instance. Remember the map we saw at the beginning? This is a very large area. I don't know what you would hope to do with just a few troops on the ground unless those men were being targeted to eliminate or tackle a particular problem, a particular cell. The drones are a very useful tool, as I say. But like any tool, it must be used carefully. Counterterrorism can work if you are tackling a terrorist group in Mali or any other part of the Sahel. But counterterrorism is just one tool to be used. The problem of ransoms is a massive one. Nobody has an accurate figure for how much these groups have raised by kidnapping and ransom. 10 million, 40 million, 60 million dollars in the past decade. We are talking about tens of millions. We just don't know how many. I think the point is not how much they've got, but how much we can stop them getting in the future. Now again, if one of your loved ones was kidnapped, I'm sure you would move heaven and earth to pay whatever was asked of you. But the payment of ransoms only feeds insecurity in the region. There are money trails which should be followed. And a final thought on ransoms and, and the general payment of them, and, and it's the point I think I'll close on, is that we can have smart counterterrorism. If anybody's read Stan McChrystal's uh, recent book on, on special forces, he makes a very good point about gathering intelligence. He's a great one for his history, is Stan McChrystal. Uh, and in that, we're, we're absolutely lockstep with each other. You've got to know your history. You've got to know local circumstances. With those things, and let's say we could form an international task force to deal with the problem of the, the, the violent cells that we can find, to deal with the money trails. I think an international force, small in number, spreading the bill, would be far more effective than any blanket attempt to dominate a country such as Mali with 4,000 French troops or 10,000 ECOWAS troops. It's not going to work. You might deny the enemy the ground today, but they will be back tomorrow. Corrupt officials in Bamako, poor elections that don't represent the people, these are the things that have to be dealt with. Development comes after genuine democracy, and that is central to the wider problems of Mali and the Sahel. And on that, I'm leaving Thank there. you, Eamon. That was a very brilliant uh, presentation. Let me ask you, um, because it's unclear to me the exact sequence of events that we, we used to think of Mali as a sort of relatively functional African nation and quite democratic. What happened? I mean, you, you said that the fall of Gaddafi was an accelerant but not the catalyst to this chaotic situation. Walk us through the steps about how that chaotic situation was precipitated. And also, give us an assessment of how you know, the French army was greeted as an army of liberation, which that's not intuitive. I mean, in a country that was, until relatively recently, part of the French Empire. So why did that, why, why did that happen in that way? Mm -hmm. Again, give us an assessment. You, at the end, just there, you implied that um, you know, these guys have gone into the hills and they'll remain there and they might come back. I mean, give us an assessment of the French operation as a military operation. 
Um, French went in on the 11th of January 2013. Initially, 1,000 troops went up to 4,000. A survey conducted in, in Bamako, it must be said, in the south of Mali rather than in the north, found a 98% approval rating for French an intervention in Mali. Hmm. Um, as, as Peter intimated, this is not intuitive when we think of the French colonial history in that part of the world. So why were they so welcomed? Well, nobody wants instability. But instability exists. Too bad. You know, we always talk about in an ideal world, dot, dot, dot. Well, it ain't an ideal world. And Mali is far from an ideal country in an imperfect world. Since independence, there have been four significant rebellions by Tuaregs in the north of the country. Tuaregs seeking a higher degree of autonomy, some of them independence, as I said. It's a great irony that the coup which launched the current wave of trouble in Mali was an accidental coup um, led by some very junior officers, um, a captain, I'm just thinking now about Libya, 1969, and one Captain Gaddafi. Um, these these low-level officers, um, or Egypt indeed, 1952, um, Egyptian officers, Libyan officers, Malian officers, uh, coups, counter-coups. It's an irony, though, that the, the army who launched the coup, or the elements of the Malian army that launched the coup, did so because they were unhappy that the government in Bamako was not doing enough for security in the north of the country. How ironic, then, that their coup led to two-thirds of the country being overrun in a matter of months. Indeed, over a long weekend after the coup, the Malian army that were gathered in the north of the country were expelled as easily as a hot knife going through butter. The Malian army is, is relatively small, some 4,500 strong. They're not well-equipped. They're not well-trained. They are demoralized and they are divided. This would be a central component of any future development for the country, is the wholesale reform of the Malian security forces. Um, some people complain that America, AFRICOM, have done too much. They, they've done too much training in Mali, and that was the, the fact that certain officers who were trained by America then led the coup, and this was the problem, as though America was somehow responsible. Nonsense. The problem, as I see it, is not that the Americans were interfering too much, is that there was, quite frankly, not enough training of Malian forces. I would propose far deeper, long-term training of the Malian army, so that it becomes a credible force in the country. Another way that it has to be made credible is to get rid of regional branches of the army. One reason that the Malian army is so hated in the north of the country is because of the countless tales of summary execution by southern Malian troops against northern Malian civilians. You simply can't have this extension of the social division in the country being put into the armed forces. It means that even on a good day, the northern population of Mali resists any attempt at interference by southern Malian troops. Very important, I think, to get rid of those regional differences within the army. Yeah, moving uh, to some of the neighboring countries, um, what's your assessment of what's going on in Libya right now? I mean, it, from, the out, from the outside, it looks like it could have been a lot worse. Uh, they've had an election that w produced a sort of non-Islamist uh, government. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people are very obsessed here about Benghazi, but I mean, that's one incident in one city. What is the bigger picture in Libya right now? Mm. Um, at the time of the civil war in Libya, I was cautiously optimistic that that country might find the swiftest path towards a brighter future of any of those countries that had seen the toppling of their dictators in the past two years. The reason for my cautious optimism, as I like to say, is that if I'm wrong, there's plenty of time for pessimism down the line. But seriously, Libya has a very small population. It has a very great wealth. And it is begging people to come in and help. 
Right now, the West could do a great deal more in terms of um, security sector reform in Libya. And the Libyan government, such as it is, would be willing to pay for this. Now, that's not a scenario that we often come up against. And in these days of sequester, a foreign country encouraging you to come in and train your forces and offering to foot the bill for you, well, it's, it's unique, I think, in my experience. The situation broadly in Libya is not very good. How's that for an insightful observation? We have a very worrying development now where armed militias besiege government ministries until a vote is taken, they get their way, they disperse. Let's remember this though. Those armed militias that have recently dispersed from outside the interior ministry and other government buildings in both Tripoli and Benghazi were forced to disperse by unarmed civilians. The militias, again, do not represent the majority of Libyans. But people with guns, obviously, have a far greater say in what happens in the country. That's why Libya really desperately needs to get an effective police force operating again and an effective army. It can be done. It can be done in fairly short order. Six to 12 months, we could have a functioning uh, security force in that country. How, by the way? Hmm? How? I mean, the first thing that has to be done, well, we have the willing partner. We, that is, countries of the West who have an interest there, and we all have an interest there, need to decide to invest our time and our talent in this security sector reform. How is it done? Well, there are certain militias that we will fold in to these security forces. Again, it's the, the situation of reconciliation. You have to sit down and sometimes sup with the devil if you're going to get an effective solution. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that we employ terrorists to watch Libya. That's not the answer. But there are plenty of armed militias who fought against Gaddafi who now feel that their voices are not being heard. I do not support militias besieging government buildings to force the hand of the government. But I do think that very many of these armed men can and indeed should be folded into both the police and the army, uh, the armed forces, that is, of Libya. What's your assessment of the government there? I mean, what is their orientation? And, um, I, and I forgive my ignorance. Is it a sort of relatively short-term government? There'll be another one? Is it? Um, assessment of the government. I mean, the poor government, they don't have the tools for the job. Um, and I know that uh, we talk about Islamist government, non-Islamist government. And in Libya, people were somewhat surprised that the government wasn't more Islamist, whatever that means. It's, it's, a, it's a, a movable feast. I mean, I think the fact is that um, the first set of major elections post-Gaddafi, all of the candidates were good Muslims. It was easy for Jabril to stand up and say, hey, you know, I'm not having you telling me I'm not a good enough Muslim, you with your Islam in the title of your political party. It rather pulled the rug out from under the feet of those that would say, we are standing for an Islamic state. Because there was no division in the country between those who are for or against some form of Sharia law. Sharia law existed under Gaddafi. Sharia law exists in many countries in many different forms. I mean, the implementation of Sharia law is what worries a lot of people in the West. I say we have other things to worry about right now. In Egypt, when we look at, are the Brotherhood going to have more Sharia law? Maybe they will, but that's not the problem for Egypt today. I, I, frankly, I don't care if you can wear a bikini and drink a beer. Egypt's problems are much deeper, and it's the economic problems in Egypt that need to be addressed, not how many bars are closed over the long weekend of the prophet's birthday. We'll sketch out um, how things may play out in Egypt and how these economic problems might be dealt with. I mean, don't, isn't it sort of like in this country where everybody kind of knows what, the, what you need to do on, you know, in, in some measure on revenues and entitlements, but the, the politics around that is incredibly difficult. So in Egypt, presumably subsidies would have to be dealt with um, and uh, creating a better investment environment uh, these are not, but these are not easy things to, to and, and perhaps a higher tax base. 
Um, yes, when you say that they're not easy things to do, you're, you're not wide of the mark. It's, um, the, the economic woes of Egypt are deep, and they have very, uh, very complex solutions. Let's deal with it in two minutes. Um, first thing to say is that, yes, subsidies have to be got rid of, but not overnight. It's been tried in Egypt. It's been tried in Algeria. It was tried in Tunisia. It, go was, back tried, it was tried in Iraq with disastrous effects. Tried right? in Iraq. Go back over a 60-year period. Uh, I can give you a dozen examples of where a government has been forced by IMF, World Bank, to remove subsidies. And what happens? Riots in the street, etc., etc., etc. The subsidy system in Egypt is broken. It's wholly broken. Um, the subsidies are on fuel and flour. If anybody who's been to Egypt and seen this so-called baladi bread, the cheap bread that people rely on, you see them at the twice a day coming out of the bakery with 10 or 20 loaves stacked high. It's the staple. Without a subsidy on bread, many people in Egypt would simply starve to death. That's the argument for keeping subsidies in place. However, on the flip side, the subsidies are so strong that people buy this bread to feed to their animals. It's so overly subsidized, and it's universal across the country, it's simply unsupportable. There, there has to be a system implemented whereby those who need the subsidy get the subsidy, and those who can afford to buy their own bread buy their own bread. Um, I, you know, food stamps exist in this country, and, I, and I'm not saying that the situation is, is like for like, but there is a system in place whereby people are means tested. As I say, when you have people in Egypt buying bread to feed to their horses and their cows, you know that there's too much being paid in subsidies. 2011, 26% of government spending was on subsidies. Mm. That's simply unsupportable. By the way, where, where is SCAP, the armed forces in all this? I mean, they seem to have kept a sort of relatively low profile, but maybe I'm not following it enough mm. to... But they certainly kept a low profile of late. Um, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, uh, some people in Egypt now would like them back in power. Um, you know things are bad when, when they, people are calling for a, a military coup in your country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, actually, which raises a sort of, sort of a lie question. You know, there's two models here, which is one of which you know, could be Pakistan on a really mm. bad day or, or Egypt on a really good day. And, and you know, which, one, which one of those is more plausible, where you know, in Egypt you still have a strong military, but they've taken a back seat, and you have an Islamist government of sort of relatively moderate, where, and, and we're, where we all know what Pakistan looks like. It's a little bit better today, I think, than it might have been a year ago. But where do you see Egypt heading? And, 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 as a, and, and where do you see its military heading hmm. as part of that? Um, we must remember that the, the uh, Egyptian military are central to the Egyptian economy. This is something which is, is often neglected, overlooked, or perhaps unknown even among some uh, mm. not too close observers. We don't know quite how much of the national economy is in the pocket of the Egyptian armed forces. And it's not just through military aid. It's not just through concessions on uniforms. It's in everything from concrete manufacturing plants to olive oil bottling plants. Some estimates say that Egyptian military and its subsidies account for 40% of the national economy. So what's the future? Well, you're going to have to prize those fingers off at least portions of the Egyptian economy. And again, when we think about solutions to a problem, I, I often like to point out that this is not a situation which goes away. You know, this is life. This is, this is a country. It, it keeps going. We have a situation today, it will be a different situation next year. But we never come to a scenario where everything is fixed and rosy. It keeps going. Thinking about the military and their role in the future of Egypt, some people have pointed to Turkey and said, well, you know, Egyptian military very strong in Turkey, and now today, backseat, democracy. Fine, if that's the way it's going to go, maybe. But that took 20 years. Yeah. And I think people have to be aware that when we look at solutions, we can't wait 20 years to get the Egyptian economy back on its feet. It simply is not going to, you know, we can't allow that to happen. Well, what is the IMF asking um, Egypt? Um, well, again, it's the removal of subsidies, or at least yeah. a partial removal of subsidies. And I, I think they've, they've got a very valid point there. But then if the IMF uh, loans simply get funneled into sorting out the problem of making up the difference in subsidies, then you're, you know, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, as my mother would have put it. 
um, it's not very sensible. What about Tunisia, which is a country with a small population and um, you know resources at least from tourism and had a sort of semi-successful election which produced an Islamist government? Mm. Yes, tourism in Tunisia. If you've never been to Tunisia on holiday, you must go. Um, and I wouldn't encourage you to wait a year or two. Go right now. You'd be perfectly safe. You have my word for it. Um, although I don't sell insurance, so you might want to take that with a pinch <laughs> of salt. No, um, Tunisia has a great deal going for it. Like Egypt, it's got most tremendous human capital. That's something which Libya is wanting for, is the skills. Libya doesn't have the skills to deal with the, the problems they're having. And they've had 40 years without an effective civil service. Everything was controlled by the brother leader and his family. It's very difficult to imagine a country getting back on its feet if there's been no tradition of a real civil service or indeed civil society. Uh, people said, look at the oil and gas industry in, in Libya. It's up and running again within 11 months. Well, big deal. It wasn't destroyed. And it's only up and running because of the foreign expertise that's come back to get it up and running. Um, going back to Tunisia and Egypt, though, they have tremendous human capital, very skilled workforces. They have greater opportunities. They have a much more diverse economy than Libya, of course. If you look at the uh, exports for Libya and Algeria, um, we're looking at 90, 95, 98% is from the petroleum sector. That is not the definition of a diverse economy. Mm. Uh, Egypt and Tunisia do have greater diversity. The Islamist government in Tunisia, um, I don't know why we need to call it moderate Islamist. They're, they're Islamist, and it's fine. Mm. We have to deal with this. It's, it's a Muslim country. They elected these people. They, have, they are doing a creditable job under the circumstances. But the fallout from Mali is, is, is significant there. I mean, just uh, last month, there were... Tunisian border guards killed in clashes with armed rebels who'd come from Mali via Algeria, via Libya, on both borders. They're finding people crossing over. The security forces in Libya and uh, Tunisia are somewhat effective along the borders. But again, those desert borders are large, even in a small country. So prognosis for Tunisia? Um, if I grade it, I give it a B plus right now. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Libya grade? <laughs> What's a failing grade? That's well, a, in America, uh, it's an F, I think. Uh, um, yeah, well, in, uh, in England, we're, I mean, I think it's a C. Uh, well, let, let's, let's put the grade to one side for a second, <laughs> and I'll just write at the bottom. My comment would be, must try harder. Um, Is that what you I, put for your students, most uh, of them? Or? No, no, my <laughs> students are very good. They, they, they tried jolly hard. Not my patients. I mean, they, <laughs> no, they have a very good plot. Um, it's sad, really, because Libya has the greatest opportunity, I think, simply because of its homogenous population, small scale, based just along that uh, Mediterranean littoral. And mm. um, the country is, well, GDP in Libya uh, could be the same as Kuwait. I mean, it, mm. it could be right up there. Mm. It's got proven oil reserves that put it in the top 10 globally. Mm. There's money there to be spent. And I think this is one of the problems. People think that the militias um, are controlling the country as they are now, but the militias could be bought off too. Mm. And I think this is what we do. We fold them into the national army, provide them with jobs, provide them with a sense of nationhood. It does exist in Libya. People talk about the split between the East and the West in Libya. Yes, it's real. It's been there since, um, well, ancient times when Cyrene was Greek province in the East, the, the Jebel Akhtar, the mountains in Eastern Libya, um, and Rome, Roman uh, Libya was the Western part of the country. It doesn't mean that that division is permanent, absolute, or insurmountable, because it's not. I've been in eastern Libya, I've been in western Libya, I've been in southern Libya. When the Libyan national football team play, they're all Libyans, trust me. Would you recommend a tourist a, a, a holiday right now in Libya, or is it too problematic? Um, I think for tourism, it's a little sketchy at the moment. Um, there are other jobs to be done down there. Um, but yeah, the, the, the people need to be visiting Libya, but not for the purposes of tourism. Final question before I throw it open to everybody here. Um, Morocco, you know, the king seems to have, you know, managed mm. perhaps a little bit like King Abdullah in Jordan. I mean, these are countries with no resources, except Morocco has tourism, um, and they can't buy off the population with oil revenue. Mm. Um, the king obviously has some 
religious legitimacy, mm -hmm. right? Because he claims mm -hmm. that he's a direct descendant of the Prophet and he was opening up even before the Arab Spring, is that correct? I mean, he was making some moves in a... So is he, is he a genuine... Uh, is he generally on the way to a constitutional monarchy or is it sort of window dressing? Um, I don't see a constitutional monarchy as, as exists, for instance, in Britain, um, springing out in Morocco. Well, a constitutional monarchy in Britain in 1832 or something. Yes. Yeah. And Definitely. 1832 would be a good, good marker. Um, Morocco, yes, the person of the king in Morocco is inviolable. He can't be criticized. One can't speak ill of him. He is the state. This um, you know, raises questions uh, of its own. True in Thailand as well, right? Yes. So, I mean, you can have a, you can have a sure. quite a democratic state. Absolutely. With, right. Absolutely. That, that, I was going to say, is not really a big problem in Morocco. What is a problem in Morocco uh, is, and it's a problem for the region, for the Maghreb, is Western Sahara. Um, it's a question which in Morocco one isn't allowed to raise. Western Sahara, disputed territory, according to the United Nations and every other country in the world, is waiting to see if it will become independent or not. For 20 years, the United Nations have been promising a referendum, but in those 20 years, the time hasn't been quite right. Uh, you can see where this is going, uh, nowhere very fast. For Morocco, it's a source of pride that Western Sahara is part of Morocco. It's integral. There's no question about it being disputed territory. That is a serious problem. Morocco spends a great deal of money policing these enormous berms, sand walls, like the Romans built around Tunisia um, 2,000 years earlier. Today, we have generation, second generation now, born in refugee camps in Tindouf in Algeria. Now, that's where we will find radicalization growing. Indeed, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, we know, have gone to Tindouf. They have been recruiting there. There have been Spanish and Italian aid workers kidnapped from the refugee camps in Tindouf. Not by Al-Qaeda as it happens, but by other groups working out in northern Mali. It's a great problem, I think, that while Morocco is unwilling to discuss even the possibility of a greater degree of autonomy for the Sahrawi people in Western Sahara, we're not going to make any progress on, on the issue. Now, why are they there? Because uh, Western Sahara has the largest phosphates uh, supply in the world, hmm. number one. Um, Somewhere around 80% of world phosphates can be found in Western Sahara. What are they used for? Um, you, wanna, you, you want uh, better yields for your crops? Mm. It's phosphates which are going to be the big thing in 50, 60 years from now. Phosphates. We're not going to want to eat any less, and the population of the world is getting more. It's phosphates which would be the black, or in the case of phosphates, the white powder, which really speaks volumes, far more than the, the tons of cocaine that are traveling across the Sahara today. Phosphates are used in, in just about every field of industry, and they're a finite resource. There is no substitute for phosphates at the moment, and the Moroccans are not going to give up hmm. those um, phosphate mines. Now, Morocco doesn't have to worry, of course, because nobody in the international community is doing anything about this but they might want to worry about radicalization on their borders. But what about, and what about just the general project of the king to mm. sort of open up more space um, politically? I think it's credible. Um, I think that the king is making inroads towards opening up. Uh, I think they're credible, and I think that he's very fortunate that um, he is beloved in the country, um, perhaps not by 100% of subjects, but then who is? Yeah, so, but it's going to be a while before the subjects turn into citizens? Yes. Great, we'll turn it, open it up to you. If you have a question, can you wait for the microphone, identify yourself? And Annie, who's holding the microphone, raise your hand if you have a question. This gentleman here. Thank you, I'm Francisco Martreo. I, I run a counter-radicalization foundation in Pakistan. You, you mentioned the fact that the role of the international, or the, at least the Western community, was to help formulate a national dialogue in Mali, but I think you also mentioned that you know, we really don't know who the actors in Mali are and who we should invite to the table. So how do you see that role you know, going forward? If we really don't know who we invite, how do we actually encourage them to hold a national dialogue? Can I ask you a sort of follow-up question? Is why do we care about Mali at all? I mean, given the 40 million population, and I mean, is, it, what is, it, is there a reason we should? Mm. 
Um, who do we talk to? It's, it's, it's not fair to say we really don't have any idea. We have some idea, and there are people, um, you know, if I might include myself among them, who spend a considerable amount of time looking at uh, the situation across the Sahara. Um, we do know who to talk to, but the trouble is the government in Bamako isn't willing to talk to everybody. I think this is, this is the central problem. Um, as much as the West is ignorant, perhaps, in broad terms about with, with whom we should be speaking, there's an unwillingness with the government in the South, which is the bigger problem. Um, Mali is not strategically important in and of itself, but as a place through which there is massive amounts of drugs traveling, mm. it becomes relevant. Transnational security, uh, transnational insecurity, should I say, and crime go hand in hand. And I think that's a problem in Europe as much as it is just for the citizens in northern Mali. Um, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not that optimistic that we're going to have the national dialogue that I think is required. That, that's my honest assessment. I don't believe it's going to happen because there isn't the political will in Bamako. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen. In much the same way that the elections are going to go ahead, but I don't think they should. We have to deal with the situation as we find it. And we have to continue to apply pressure for those solutions, which I think will uh, produce the best long-term results. Uh, you know, in Benghazi, what, what's your sort of take about um, the issue of um, what happened there? Is it, and, and what is the situation in Benghazi today? Hmm. Um, what happened in Benghazi was that four Americans were killed in uh, an adjunct office. Um, including an ambassador, which, as we know, hadn't happened for decades. It was very tragic, not least for the families of those involved. What happened in Benghazi is not central, however, to the future of Libya. Um, I am a little tired, frankly, of the continuing debate. But then, as you may have gathered, I'm not from uh, these parts originally. I understand inside the beltway discussions of who's responsible can go on for years. And while we have another inquiry as to who said what, when, to whom, and why, we are really missing an opportunity to speak to the Libyans about what they need for the future of the country. Um, that's what I say. Yeah. The British ambassador had been attacked in, in mm -hmm. June. Um, Asquith. Asquith. Yeah. And he, uh, in fact, he went to my high school. He, uh, he, um, that's not why he was attacked. No, no, no. no. There's, it would have been a very legitimate reason to attack him. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, the British uh, clearly were concerned and, and, and basically prevented people from staying overnight from that point forward. Mm. I mean, isn't, forgetting about the issue of the talking points for a minute, which is obviously a big issue in DC, but what was the issue of um, the extent to which uh, it was foolhardy to have that kind of list, CI listening post in a sort of undefended manner in Benghazi with people being overnight, staying overnight, or is that, you know, should there have been a better situation on the security? Um, well, look, when you have a, a compound which is overrun and four people die, then um, obviously security should have been better. Um, should it have been there at all? I, I mean, I, I can't really speak for the American intelligence community, but I would say probably yes. Um, we have to be on the ground listening to people. We have to be on the ground talking to people. Nobody said that the job of intelligence gathering was easy or trouble-free. If you don't want trouble, you don't go to war. Um, yeah. It's a difficult situation. Yes, people will die. Um, there it is. It doesn't mean that we should now withdraw and, and not wish to be involved any further. Sure. Indeed, the opposite should be true, that we should become more heavily engaged as we realize the seriousness you of know, the security threat in, in Libya. Last week, there was a report that a group of uh, people associated with Al-Qaeda were planning to attack the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Mm -hmm. Seemed to be, uh, that was from state, uh, from MENA, the mm -hmm. Egyptian state news service. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda or groups affiliated to it have been pretty act active in the Sinai. They have attacked a number of hotels. Um, how would you assess, and of course, you know, Ayman al zawari is an Egyptian, he runs Al-Qaeda. Many of the senior people who are still alive in Al-Qaeda are Egyptian. Is there any chance that these groups, and you know, the history of course is that in the 90s these groups killed about a thousand people and there was a Luxor massacre and in 97 that kind of basically put, a, put the kibosh on these groups mm -hmm. for a while. 
Is there any likelihood that these groups might come back? Because it seems to me that Egyptians have sort of lived through a pretty bad experience with these groups in a relatively recent past. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, you know, the Salafis have 25% of the parliamentary seats, something that the US intelligence community seems to have completely yeah. missed as a potential. Uh, so how would you score the kind of political environment on the sort of Salafi jihadist side in Egypt right now? Um, Salafi groups um, are not the same as jihadi groups. I think right. it's important to say, although there can be uh, an overlap between them. Um, just because one is a, a, a Salafi, it doesn't mean that one is a violent jihadi. They're, they're different, and it must be, must be very clear on this. Um, Islam 101 would be very good reading for, for any number of officials in, in this town, London, and beyond. Um, they, the, the violent jihadi groups are certainly on the increase in Egypt. That, of that, there's no doubt. Why is that? Many reasons. A, a big one is because the Muslim Brotherhood have failed to get a grip of security in their own country. Now, I don't care if there's a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt or not, frankly. Um, I don't care who's in government, as long as they do a good job of governing. And that's what's absent at the moment in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood have failed to deal with security. They have failed to deal with the economy. These are two very major issues. And while we have this uncertainty, there will be an increase in um, security threats in the Sinai, for example. Now, will they come back and pose a, a threat to the state? I don't think so. What they do pose a threat to, of course, is tourism, yeah. a very important source of revenue in Egypt. Um, they don't pose a threat yet, for instance, to Suez Canal rev revenues, which is another very important source. Yeah. Um, they don't have the capability to do anything major in that sense. But then if we think back to 1997 and the uh, terrorist attack at the Temple of Hatshepsut, when 47 uh, tourists were murdered in, in a very, very bloody fashion, that was easy to do because it was a remote tomb guarded by a few of these tourist police who, if anybody's been to Egypt, you're as likely to find them um, asleep as you are on uh, alert. Um, it's a problem, but it's not an existential problem. But the right kind of attack, you're saying, could put, you know, kill the, what remains of the tourism economy, which yes. is... Yes, yeah, I'm, yeah. How, how do you, um, what's the term of the present government? And um, I mean, obviously they're doing a terrible job, but it seems to me that almost anybody would do a terrible job because the problems are so bad. I think the, the, the biggest problem that the Muslim Brotherhood face are not the problems of Egypt, but it's the problem of themselves. Um, and what I mean by that is that they have displayed no ability to grasp the economic woes of the country. Mm. Um, it's all well and good saying that Islam is the answer, but we must go back and ask, well, what was the question? Um, and in Egypt today, the question is not one of religion. Nobody's suggesting that Egypt will become a less religious society. The problem is one of economics. And the Muslim Brotherhood have failed to get anybody on board their team, as far as I've seen, that knows anything about international monetary affairs. Yeah. They don't have any grasp, it seems, of domestic economics. These are very serious problems, and that's what they need to deal with. In the back here, this gentleman. Thanks. I'm Jack Hinman. Hi, Evan. Hi, talked Jack. before about this. Um, where, where are you from, sir? State Department. And I, was, I had a couple of questions. One, I was curious about, um, uh, I think we may touch on this before, about part of the problem all over the the west of Africa is that even with the colonial regimes gone, even if even if there if the dictatorships were gone, almost all the populations on the coast, and all these northern and southern people, the people in the central areas, the Tuareg peoples, that they're a tiny minority you know, numerically, and they don't have much power even in a perfectly fair, even a totally democratic system. They'd be on the short end of it. And I'm just wondering, you know, we talked before there was a. At one point, I think there was talk about at the end of the colonial regimes or some point about making an interior state that, in fact, was made up of those people, which would be more unified. Now, I don't think that's, doesn't sound like that's possible, but um, what, what do you think is going to be the outcome of how to, how to get those people more fairly treated by the coastal population of the cities where the people are? Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, I've been in Jordan. I've been a long time since so I've been in Morocco, but uh, we lived in Spain, but uh, the population balance of those... Uh, of, of, I know there's Berber and there's Tuareg and there's Arab, but I'm not really sure of the proportions in those countries. In Jordan, Jordan and, and, and Morocco are both 
talking sort of a gradual development towards democracy, which seems to be, it seems like they are doing it to me, actually, like, like you're saying. But they, uh, that was used as a defense by regimes that had no intention of, of changing, you know, shifting power at all. In the South, that was constantly talked about. We're going to bring the, the blacks up to equal citizenship, but, but it'll take time. And the, um, in, in Jordan, the population is almost 80% Palestinian. So the East Bankers, if there was a totally free election and everything's totally fair, no retribution, no nothing, the, bed, the, the East Bankers would lose control of their own country. There's an inherent difficulty uh, in, in, in their population. Is there a population problem like that in um, an inherent imbalance in Morocco that the king's on okay. you know, one side or the other of? Um, the question of the interior of these countries first. Um, you know, the, the interior of, of all of the Saharan countries and Sahelian countries is, is remote. Um, I'm just trying to remember, there's a, there's a line in, in, uh, in uh, the Sahara from a 10th century traveler. I mean, throughout the centuries, people have described it as a difficult and desolate land. It is very far from the centers of power, and I think it's the disenfranchisement of the populations there which is a, is a major problem. Um, all politics is local. Well. Yeah, that may be, but if you don't have any representation because you're so remote from those um, sometimes coastal, as you say, uh, centers of power, it's going to lead to long-term problems. And they might be small populations, but just as the number of radical Islamists in the world are but a drop in the ocean when compared to the total Muslim population of the globe, it doesn't take too many uh, idiots with rocket-propelled grenades to, to create a big fuss. I think that's, that's a big problem. Um, as to the balance um, in Morocco, no, I, I don't see that the, that the king has to worry about that. No, it's, it's not exactly homogenous, but it's, um, you don't have the same differences as you do elsewhere. Question here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Andrew Turner from the UK. Um, Eamon, your point, your sort of central thesis is all politics are local, which you just repeated there. I wonder whether, is, is, given the um, porous borders, the cross-boundary migration of people over time, over p substantial periods and eras, and the lack of representation down in Bamako, in Mali in particular, but it applies to other places in the Sahara and Sahel itself as well, is there a, um, a, a an opportunity here for a model of a sort of federated and decentralized and specially administered form of government, which does provide a degree of linkage back to a center, but that still provides quite a lot of freedom and autonomy to those in the more disparate regions, and not just on security, but on economic, pastoral, social boundaries, but a loose connection back into a federal center. Yes. Um, uh, short answer. answer. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a very good question. It, it, you're, you're right. That there's a great deal of complexity here with, with the, the, the areas you've mentioned. But yes, I, I do think that there is, there is an opportunity to discuss the idea of um, a federated system. What we don't have in the region, which I think is, is if I may, coming out of your question, is cooperation. Um, in 1989, there was something uh, called the Arab Maghreb Union was started, which was uh, supposed to have five of the countries up there um, from Morocco down to form an economic union. Um, nothing came of it, but it's a great idea. It's, it's, what is ECOWAS and what does that stand for? What does it do? Well, ECOWAS is a West African uh, economic union. The, the AMU, the, the problem, going back to your borders, um, for instance, between Morocco and Algeria, the border has been closed since 1994. Um, the interior ministers did meet. Interior ministers of Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Mauritania, and Mali met last month in Rabat. Um, so the Algerians have to fly as they would anyway. But the idea that your, your government ministers can't even meet on the border, at that meeting last month, they discussed with serious intent, the idea of reopening the Moroccan-Algerian border. But there's no regional economic integration. There's no regional cooperation at the moment. There was, in southern Algeria, an intelligence-sharing base set up in, in, the, the, in Taman Rasset. Um, it was set up. It wasn't fully functioning. That was supposed to get together uh, intelligence operators from the countries of the region. Um, it was blown up within the first month of it opening by um, an Al-Qaeda-affiliated group, um, since which time I don't believe they've reopened it. But certainly I, I would 
propose at least for the, the, the immediate troubles on the ground of radical groups operating freely in the Sahara, a much higher degree of regional cooperation. And it needs to be done soon. Two gentlemen in back here. Daniel De Moro, Johns Hopkins says. Uh, the question is this. Uh, I am Italian. We went through transition after the Second World War and was a success story for all Western Europe. Then there was uh, the Berlin Wall fall. It was uh, a success story of transition for the former communist countries. Now the question is, is your opinion positive or negative about this kind of transition? Because my impression is that we had a change, uh, but we don't have a transition in these countries. So in, in some way, we will end up giving, in some way, support to the Algerians and the Israeli opinion that this change was uh, a mistake in some way. Yeah. I mean, and, and sort of a corollary of that is, you know, the reason that the transition in Eastern Europe kind of worked is there was an agreement in Eastern Europe about what the transition should be too, which was something that didn't look very dissimilar from Western Europe. There doesn't seem to be... Yeah, it's, it, uh, there are parallels for sure, but then don't forget in Eastern Europe we were looking at a monolithic system. I mean, uh, everything was, was, it was a communist system from Moscow with satellites. Um, you know, the Middle East is not like that. No, we but have but the, point, the point is, is that people agreed about what the next step should look like. So the problem in these places is that there may not be an agreement about what the next step should look like. We, quite, but then uh, the countries um, that have overthrown their uh, leaders in the past two years um, each have very distinct um, histories and very distinct cultures, which in Eastern Europe didn't exist in the same sense that, yes, the cultures were different, but the political culture had been the same under, under communism. Mm. In North Africa and the Middle East, we're dealing with very different political systems, both under the dictators and since. Um, there is no agreement because there can't be any agreement. Each of the countries is different, and they must be treated as unique entities if you're to have any chance of, of understanding them. While we lump countries together, I don't know who was the historian who said, or rather, it was said of all historians, they're either lumpers or splitters. Um, it's good to put things together, yes, but also it's important to separate them to see the differences. And I think each uh, country should be, should be dealt with quite separately. For example, um, the Italians in Libya. Um, they did a very credible job in a very short time period of infrastructure projects, such as road building in Libya. The roads that the Italians built in the 1920s, 30s uh, are better than the roads that are being built in the region today. Um, as it happens, they were, they, were, they were carefully accounted for. They were budgeted from Rome so that the last payment for the uh, Trans-Libyan Road was made in 1942. Now, the Italians didn't build that so that farmers could get to market, of course. They did that so they could move their troops across the country. As it happens, in 1942, it was the British troops that were moving across <laughs> the country, but, but they had the Italian infrastructure uh, on which to do this. I think infrastructure in North Africa is, I don't think, infrastructure is dire in North Africa. I think there's an opportunity there for regional cooperation that would benefit the eco economies of the countries of the region. Take a couple of these questions in the back. We'll bunch them together here. Uh, Andrew Evans with the Washington Free Beacon. You mentioned that Mali is not in itself a strategic interest of the United States, for example, of the West. Uh, one, one area where it might become a strategic uh, interest, however, is if AQIM gains a foothold. Um, so could you go over briefly what is the current status of al-Qaeda uh, in Mali? And is there the, the potential for Mali to become a sort of stronghold or a, a, or a, you know, a base area like a Yemen or a I mean, certainly not becoming like Somalia, but mm -hmm. potentially moving in that direction. Is that a possibility? Do you want to take another one? Yeah, we'll take another one in the back. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Morgan with Red Eagle Enterpri Enterprises and the blog Confused Eagle. We have noticed in recent weeks a very aggressive foreign policy by Chad, you know, sending troops to Mali, assisting Nigerian security operations in the northeastern part of the country and its role in the CAR crisis. 
I was wondering if you would actually speak to what other role, other, uh, <laughs> what you see of Chad playing in this situation. Thank you. Um, yes, I think Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb and other radical groups in northern Mali are um, a question that America needs to address, certainly. I'm not suggesting for a second that we should ignore the security threat that exists. Can they gain a foothold? Um, yes, um, and I think they can come back tomorrow. Um, don't what forget is, there what are what parts. Is, what does come back mean? I, I mean. was going to say there are parts of northern Mali where the, um, the French troops have not yet visited. There are, don't, we, we mustn't think for a second that all of northern Mali is under the control of the central government, the French troops that are, are in place. It's not. There are bits of northern Mali which are still beyond the pale. Hmm. Um, the role of uh, Chadian troops, well, Chadian troops were used in northeastern Mali alongside the French because the French were desperate to keep the Malian army out of northeast, uh, northeast of their own country. Why? As I mentioned, because of the, the, the history of, uh, the alleged history of summary executions, of brutality uh, in the area meted out by the national Malian army on its own citizens. The Malian army is not a creditable force. Um, there's another reason they were kept out of the northeast of their own country is because they wouldn't be very effective there. Uh, the Chadians have done a pretty good job in northern Mali alongside the French, and the alongside the French bit is very important. Chadian troops have already started withdrawing in large numbers. Um, there were four Chadian troops killed last week in a suicide attack. What we're facing in northern Mali today is uh, an insurgency. There are suicide attacks taking place in Mali on a daily basis. So when we think that the French did a great job, yes, they, they may have pushed back against these people who had taken over two-thirds of Mali. Yes, we may have denied the enemy safe haven in the short term, but not universally. I mean, we may have the major uh, settlements covered, the major towns of northern Mali have been relatively secured, as I say, apart from suicide attacks, which happen on a daily basis. But by no means is the whole of northern Mali under the control of the central government with the, uh, under the aegis of, of the French. Um, so yes, it remains a problem. But I think we need to use, if we're going to have counterterrorism policy in northern Mali, it's got to be smart counterterrorism policy. We'll take some questions in the front, Annie. There's these two gentlemen over here. Thank you. My name is Colin Blowers. I'm with the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Um, I'm trying to get a grasp on the character and influence of Salafism in Mali right now. And, and kind of, as you said, there's many different strains or brands of Salafism. Um, and maybe like in Egypt, we could say, we saw Zawahiri um, kind of depart from, Al um, depart from the rest of um, Salafism in Egypt to kind of go global, maybe you could say. Um, so maybe like Salafist jihadism, global jihadism like that, maybe that we see in Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb in some way, but we also have in Egypt you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, who's also a Salafist, kind of offering an alternative to the government and providing social services um, and that kind of brand of Salafism. And I'm wondering, is there anything like that in Mali? Do we see this kind of uh, fragmentation of Salafism where you have um, this kind of Salafist jihadism um, in Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb? But is there this kind of Muslim Brotherhood-ish Salafist alternative that is providing social services? Because like you said, Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb is in this cocaine business, you know, they're getting money through that. Are they providing social services? And is there some kind of alternative that could provide social services? Because as we said, it's not just ideology that's creating their influence. It's also the fact that they provide in some capacity for the people. Thank you. Did you want to take, yeah, let me take another question from the gentleman in the red tie? Thank, thank you. I'm just picking up on your, uh, your exam scoring earlier on in your piece. Can you, can you uh, identify yourself? Uh, sorry, Edward Moore has on UK Embassy. Um, one country I haven't spoke about at all very much is Algeria. And um, other folk in the academic community and listening to these sort of um, sessions have described the relationship between Algeria and Mali very similar to that of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Algeria being a big brother and meddling very much in what northern Mali and what is going on there. Given this sort of great complex cocktail, what's happening in Algeria, the aging population, um, the enormous geographical area that it holds, the hydrocarbons, the Western diaspora working in the hydroc hydrocarbon industry, and indeed after the Alaminas um, attack, uh, uh, sort of cozying up between the UK and the US and Algeria on information sharing. I'm quite keen to understand your grade for Algeria uh, and indeed the sort of short to medium term prognosis you've got in that country given those factors. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the religious question first. Um, 
I don't know if it's worth pointing out, my undergraduate degree was in theology, so I, I, I spent a number of years studying uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in all their very many forms. Um, and, and the one thing that I remember came to me from long before my course, and that was my grandmother's words, that the devil himself can quote scripture for his own ends. Um, it's <laughs> the, the, the question of religion mm. in northern Mali is a very interesting one and a very complex one. I, I would say that the, the, is there a Muslim Brotherhood type alternative? Not yet um, in Mali, no. Mm. The jihadi influences are almost all, were almost all external. Let's go back. 15 years. Today, of course, they have taken off and, and got roots of their own, which are now more local. So it would be wrong just to think of, uh, of uh, Malians as having this uh, nice, fuzzy, touchy-feely um, Sufi tradition, although that remains very strong. Um, is there space for such a Muslim Brotherhood type political party? I suppose there may be, but I don't know that um, it's necessary. I don't think that, I think the biggest problem again is going back to this lack of representation. That the, the people simply have no government in the north of country. Um, social services you mentioned, it's interesting that in Egypt now of course, when the, the Muslim Brotherhood are in power, they're providing far fewer social services than they managed as an opposition group. So you know, be careful what you wish for. Now they have all the power. They also have the responsibility, and they have the problems of, of um, supplying these services. Um, services in northern Mali? No, nobody's providing them. What Al Qaeda and other groups are providing is uh, employment. They're providing very dangerous employment, um, but very profitable employment. Uh, you, you can make there's more money in a month of ferrying drugs across the Sahara for one of these groups than you would a lifetime working in any legitimate form in, in the country. Um, Algeria, how's it doing? Well, I suppose we need to decide in, in what regard we're talking. Uh, opening up politically, um, D. Uh, security, B minus. The attack on Enaminus was significant because it was the first time in recent history that such an installation was uh, attacked or targeted. Algeria, of all the countries in North Africa, and I'm including the Sahara and the Sahel here, has the longest, had the longest colonial occupation, 132 years of French rule, where Algeria ceased to be. Algeria was part of mainland France. It's unique in the experience of the Middle East, that it wasn't a province, it wasn't a protectorate, it was incorporated into France proper. As a result of this long and very deep colonial occupation, the Algerians remain, I think, most chary of all countries in North Africa about outside interference. What you and I might call assistance or willing partners, they see very clearly as uh, interference, and they're very keen to keep it out. The only reason, I think, that they agreed to have this security sharing apparatus in Taman Rasset is because they believed they could control it. Um, it's the most opaque regime in North Africa. It's the one that we in the West know least. And not surprising, because we have paid precious little attention to it for many, many years. What, what kind of regime is it? I mean, uh, how would you describe it? Opaque. Uh, beyond opaque. I mean, what is it? <laughs> it's Algeria, since independence, 1956-62, very bloody war of independence. Since that time, every president of Algeria has had a direct connection to that war. They've all, bar one, been military men or ministers of defense. We are now facing a, a situation in Algeria where another generation are coming through who feel no obligation towards the grand deeds of those who fought for independence. It's a new generation coming through and the old guard are not willing to give up power. The old guard don't understand how things are changing. It's like the introduction of the internet to you know, our, our grandparents. It's a very slow, painful process trying to work out the internet when you haven't had to deal with it for all of your life. In Algeria, there has been this clique, a military-dominated clique at the top of the system, right down to the bottom of the system. They're in every field of the economy, as the military are in Egypt, and they are not prepared to give up power, and they don't understand why they should. Uh, do they have periodic sort of uh, elections of some kind or that are quasi-elections? I mean, how do they... Quasi-elections, yes. Yeah. Um, but not... 
Well, let's see. Uh, to be fair, the, the Algerians would tell you, and they've told me indeed, when I, I last made uh, statements about the lack of democracy in Algeria, I was tackled by some people from the embassy um, who may be here again today morning, if you are. Um, they said, well, look, we've opened up in Algeria. Now we have opposition groups. There used to be two. Now there are 42 po political parties in Algeria. Okay. But the two major ones are of the same opinion, and the other 40 get a handful of votes apiece. It, was there a sort of Arab awakening in Algeria? Um, yes. I, I mean, I, I, I'm only hesitant because I, I don't really like the term because in Algeria there have been more protests perhaps before 2010 than in any other country of North Africa. In, in the prior decade there have been literally thousands of demonstrations in Algeria. Again, when I say we pay precious little attention to the country, you know, we have a very well-developed um, system of workers' groups in Algeria. These are the people that are protesting. There are union movements in Algeria that have been protesting. Mm. Um, but they're, they're protesting not so much for democracy as Mohamed Bouazizi, when he set fire to himself in uh, Tunisia, wasn't protesting about democracy. It's demands for economic reform that has been driving the situation in Algeria as much as Tunisia and Egypt. You might hitch the wagon of democracy on the end of that train, but it's the economy that's driving it forward every time. Any other questions? We'll take this gentleman here. Doug DeGroote, EIR Magazine. Uh, just a question about Mali and uh, Niger as a comparison. You mentioned the lack of uh, desire for a discussion and so on internally in Mali. Uh, Niger did it differently in terms of their military at least, uh, absorbed people into the military, but not as groups. They were split up and they just became part of the military. Now, does that account for the difference or was Niger less of a track for the uh, cocaine and so on, which was a big complicating I factor? I want to tackle on one question of that as well, which is Boko Haram. How would you assess how they're doing or are they going to sort of get out of Nigeria, or are they going to just focus on? Um, okay, Niger and Nigeria, I'll, I'll do them both in 60 seconds or less. Um, in the situation in Niger, yes, people are saying, is there potential there for destabilization of the country um, in the same way that it's happened in Mali? Yes, of course, there's potential. Um, it hasn't been such an important uh, drug route, but then Niger has um, something which um, as far as we know, Mali doesn't have in great quantity, and that's uranium. Um, mm. In Niger, the Does main road... yellow cake? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, need to know basis. <laughs> um, in Niger, the main north-south highway, I mean, talk about infrastructure. This road was built for right to the uranium mines. It's called the Uranium Highway. It allows movement of uranium from the north of the country south. This has a very important role in the local economy. Um, not just the, the, the uranium itself, but uh, the infrastructure, which could always be improved in, in any country of the region. But I think Niger is fortunate in many ways. And I don't really see that Niger is going to go the same way as Mali. I don't, I don't see it as a possibility. It doesn't have the degree of instability that Mali has been suffering from. And also in Niger, I mentioned very early on about um, electoral turnout. People turn out for elections in Niger in much greater numbers than they have ever done in, in Mali. So I think there is a greater degree of political participation in the country, which will always, I think, increase security. Um, Boko Haram in Nigeria, are they going to break out? Well, I mean, they have spiritual allies in other of the jihadi groups across the region, but they're not linked. They're not connected. I mean, they, they may be involved in information sharing exercises with mm. some of the other terrorist groups. But I, I don't see them breaking out. Of course, they don't have to break out to be a very major problem. As we've seen in recent days, the, the government has locked down parts of northern Nigeria because it's simply out of control. Mm. Um, the Nigerians have a, have a whole basket of serpents to deal with in northern Nigeria. Um, Boko Haram is just the one with the sharpest fangs. That was a great presentation for which we're grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.